When it comes to our physical health, it will have an impact upon those who are around us. If you receive a diagnosis or you're feeling unwell, concern and fear can grow amongst your family and friendship circles. Well, the same can be said about our spiritual health because it will have a far deeper impact upon others around us, believers in Christ. And that is because healthy Christians are serving Christians. Today is our third appointment with our family doctor, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that a healthy Christian serves because the Spirit works in us to work through us to help God's people and to make an impact upon the world. Welcome back to Wednesday in the Word. I want you to get comfortable, grab a Bible, remove all distractions, and let's dive into God's Word today. The passage that we're going to look at today is one of the most encouraging sections of the New Testament epistles, but sadly also one of the most debated among God's people, the body of Christ. And my attention today is not to enter into the dialogue of theological differences, but we want to share in the spiritual unity that God's people can enjoy together. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we will read the first 11 verses. This is a letter from Paul to the church in Corinth. And sadly, at that time, there was a growing number of problems causing divisions among God's people. There was a wide membership of that church, different cultures and people groups. There was persecution going on before the letter was written. And there was also a lot of religious and moral failure and corruption going around that time as well. But we might say that history is repeating itself in today's church. Because the church of Jesus Christ can relate to so many things that were going on in the church in Corinth. These Christians were not looking or behaving or serving in a way that they should. And maybe today we have fallen into that trap. So this letter is all about unifying a broken church. And that's what we need today. So let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 beginning at verse 1. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by the means of that same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them to each one, just as he determines. So before Paul launched in to talk about spiritual gifts, He was then dealing with the whole issue of the Lord's Supper. We looked at that together in our ninth session of the Wednesday in the Word. And he concluded there in chapter 11 verse 33 by saying, And when I come, I will give further directions. So obviously, Paul dealt with the key issues related to the Lord's Supper. There's more to say, but he said just enough to deal with the issues at hand, to deal with the current crisis. But then Paul goes on in chapter 12 to talk about spiritual gifts. And he says in verse 1, Now about the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So Paul, not like the Lord's Supper, really wanted to be as thorough as he could dealing with this issue. He wanted to make sure that nobody treated the spiritual gifts 
lightly. He didn't want anybody to say, well, this doesn't really apply to me, so I'm not going to pay attention, or I don't really care about spiritual gifts, I'll leave that to somebody else. For Paul, it was important that all believers pay close attention to this portion of his letter. Because all the believers were meant to have the right knowledge of spiritual gifts, understanding how they fit together, how they work together, how each person possesses a gift to be used in the life of the church. So here are two questions that I want you to ponder. Why are you good at particular things? Look at verses 4, 5 and 6. And then for what purposes are you good at these things? In verse 7. So press pause, have a think, and then press play when you're ready. Well, Paul says that there are different kinds of gifts, there are different kinds of service, different kinds of working. But within those differences, we have the same spirit, we have the same Lord, and we have the same God. When someone comes to saving faith in Jesus, we're not turned into clones, but we are uniquely gifted as individuals. So we're unified by the same gospel, but we have different callings. We're unified by the same spirit, but we are diverse by our gifts. You're good at particular things because God has a particular job for you and only you can do it. V verse 7 goes on to say that it was given for our common good, or it can be translated to bring together. Because God never intended us to use our gifts for ourselves, but to build each other up. If you can imagine an orchestra, you have individuals who have mastered a certain instrument. They are wonderful in their playing, but all these instruments need to come together as an orchestra to make beautiful, harmonious music. And this was the problem in Corinth. The people were aware of their gifts, but sadly they were ignorant concerning one another. They were individual musicians, let's just say, and they refused to join the orchestra. They just stayed in the practice room. And some people just loved to show off and to show their own skills. And sadly, in the church today, we can fall into that trap as well. We know our gifts, we want to display our gifts, but we want to make sure that we get the attention and the credit. Using our gifts and abilities to show people how good we are for our own praise, that does not bring people together. It's not for the common good. Well, Paul then lists off a number of gifts in verses 8 through to 11, but this is not a complete list. We can see in other epistles in Romans, Ephesians, the first letter that Peter wrote to the scattered Christians over Asia Minor. And he explains that there's more gifts, not just the ones here. There are supportive gifts, gifts of apostleship and prophecy, evangelism, pastoring and teaching. Then there's the service gifts, administration and organisation, faith, giving, help and encouragement, mercy and compassion. Then there's the sign gifts, which we see an awful lot in the Acts of the Apostles, miracles, healings, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Well, you can just see that the church is made up with very talented people because every person is talented. God gives everybody a gift. So if you're a believer watching on right now, you are gifted. If you say you're not gifted, you are then refusing the promises that God gives you by his Spirit. Because the talents that you have, they're not from you and they are not for you. So I want you to think about these very probing questions. With all of that in mind, does this truth mean that you need to change your view about your abilities in any way? Do you think too highly of your gifts? Or do you not think highly enough? And is there maybe anything that you need to speak to myself or another church leader about so that you can use your gifts within the local body?
whenever I think back on my Christian life and remember those who have had the biggest impact upon my life, very few of those people were found on a platform, a stage or a pulpit. The people that I think about who served they served in very simple but profound ways. Ways in which they wouldn't find impressive or special, but yet made a difference for me and my growth in the gospel. And maybe there's someone watching on right now and you think that you've got nothing to give, that you have no talent. Well, can I say, you're probably watched by somebody else and they value you. They are maturing because of you. Seek out what that gift might be. Because Paul goes on to use the image of a body to describe our local church and what your part would look like within that body. At this stage, I want you to take a longer pause. Now make sure you do it. And I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through to 31. And as you read through this the section, I want you to consider three areas. Ask yourself, what point is Paul making about my place in the church? In verses 15 to 20, verses 21 to 25, and then finally verse 26. What point is Paul making about my place in the church in these three sections? So press pause, have a think, and then press play. Well, in verses 15 to 20, Paul makes it very clear that diversity in the body is essential. He says there, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. A body cannot just be one big eye or one big ear or hand. The body wasn't created to have one function. And with that being said, we shouldn't be jealous of other parts of the body. Sometimes we look at other people and say, they can do more, they've achieved more, they've got greater gifts than I do. It looks more attractive, it looks more purposeful. But we need to remember that all parts make the body. Yes, hands are essential. Feet and legs are exciting. Eyes and ears are so crucial for detail. But you know, somebody needs to be a wee toe to keep the balance. And someone needs to be the backside to maybe take the brunt of life and help carry on. Not to be crude about it. But then in verses 21 to 25, it challenges us not to undermine other parts of the body. Because some people, they might feel that they've got nothing to offer. But yet there's other people who like to display their gifts so publicly so that other people feel that they can offer themselves. The thing is, if we do that, we then undermine the work that God has set out for that other person. So we shouldn't say that we're better than anybody else. And then verse 26 makes it very clear that we need to depend on one another. We can overcome division within the body, within the church, by love and concern for one another. Jesus says in John 13 verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So as Paul says here, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, then every part should rejoice with it. So we don't rejoice when other people suffer and fail. We should have hearts that are broken, wanting to comfort and draw alongside and build them up. So for you right now, this could be a crucial time for you to ask God the Spirit to give you a right view of yourself, a right view of others and a right view of your church. Not thinking that you've got nothing to offer, also not thinking that you have everything to offer, but also not thinking that you don't need anybody else. So maybe this is a time for you to ask God to give you a heart for your body, for your local church. 
that you will resolve to serve and embrace and participate in the local church and that for those who suffer that you will draw alongside them and that you'll feel joy when other people are honoured or appreciated in the church. So where do we go from this point on? Well let's read together from 1 Corinthians 13 from verses 1 through to 7. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am only a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So I want you to think about these two questions. What kind of very godly actions are potentially useless verses 1 to 3 and why and why does this mean that you could apply chapter 12 perfectly in that case and uselessly spend a couple of minutes thinking about that if you did a straw poll within the church and ask who are the gifted people within the church you might hear people say pastor, minister, preacher, theologian, evangelist, missionary, office bearer. I remember a number of years ago before going into ministry, preparing to enter into theological study. I was preaching in a country congregation and whenever I arrived I introduced myself as the person to lead the worship that day. And whenever I told that senior man who was listening to me, he then quickly bowed out of honour that I was the preacher. It was incredibly embarrassing, but yet it showed what people think about giftedness and talents. But here Paul gives a list of the most godly looking jobs within the Christian circles in verses 1 to 3. We have mountain moving faith, we've got powerful prophecy and proclamation, we've got tongues of men and of angels. And by all appearances they are miraculous, they are astonishing, it's impressive and they are extreme. But Paul says if there's no love you're just a gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, if you do all these things but you have no love, you're all talk. You're a person who just loves to hear your own voice. So Paul is getting to the fact that it's all about motivation and our spiritual gifts. Do we use our gifts out of love or to get position? Do we do it because we have affection for others or is it to get attention for yourself? Do you use your gifts to build up the church or to set yourself up above the rest. Well, without love, our prophecies, our knowledge, our faith, our charity, our compassion, our encouragement, our admin and organisation, well, they're all worthless, empty and even unworthy. And this applies to all the gifts that we can possess. So we need to thank God that we can look to him to find that love. To be motivated by that love as we read in verses 4 through to 7. We see what love looks like as we look to him. We look to God the Father who out of love sent his son. We look to God the Son because out of love he went to the cross. And we look to God the Spirit who grows fruit in us. And that first fruit that we read in Galatians 5 is love. A healthy Christian is a serving Christian but also a loving Christian and that is what the Spirit is working in you to make you. Well can I challenge you to do something? I want you to ask the Spirit of God 
to show you what your gifts are. Once you find it, I want you to ask for a right motive. And once you have a motive, I want you to then ask the Spirit of God to give you a love for him and the purposes that he has for you. And if we do this now, if we spend these last number of weeks with this lockdown, what would the church look like if the body of believers were a loving, serving group of talented people? We'll build the church. And also maybe take some time to go back to our eighth session of Wednesday in the Word on prayer. That might be a helpful refresher for you. But as we draw to the close now, let's enjoy a song as we pray for the Spirit of God to show us our talents, to give us a motive, and to send us out in love for one another. God bless you today. Gracious Father, Son, and Spirit, ever join in bonds of love. May your church share in the union of our God, the three in one. May the love of God our Father poured on us. Christ the Son, in the union of His Spirit, fill our hearts and make us one. We are one in Christ our Savior, in His death. We all have died in his resurrection power. We in him are made alive. So we all as ransomed sinners stand united in his love. Drawing near to God together. By His Spirit, through His Son. Through His Word, our gracious Savior draws us to Himself in love, built us up into a temple whereby dwells with us on foundations of his promise built on him our cornerstone may we stand as one forever may his love in us be shown Lord, forgive our sad divisions in your gospel. Make us one, bound together in your spirit, bought by Jesus' precious blood. Living worthy of our calling, let us cast all strife aside till as long we see his glory as his perfect holy bride keep us steadfast in your promise standing firm with all the saints till at last we come to heaven and as one we see your face